Hey there, turdettes. Ready for another dive into the depths of history, courtesy of my unpredictable digestive system? Buckle up, because you're about to dive into another one of my bizarre turdices. This time, it all started with needing more cat food. So I go down to the only grocery store I've shopped since spotting who I believe to be the Salem Mystery Woman. Months and still nothing. I'm left still scratching my head over that Salem Woman sighting from weeks ago. She just vanished like a sock in a dryer. Samantha seems to think I am a little obsessed with her, but she hasn't been and seen what I have. So I return home to the new ruler of the house pharaoh who is giving me the all-familiar feed me stare. And that is where things take a turn. This time, our journey starts with an unexpected culinary adventure. Cat food, believe it or not. A can of cat food that smelled suspiciously gourmet. I know, I know. My culinary standards might need a serious check. But hey, who am I to turn down a new taste adventure? In a moment of questionable judgment, I gave it a taste. Not bad, honestly. Pharaoh, however, glared at me like I'd just committed the ultimate betrayal and spoiler alert. That might have been a mistake. There I was, a grown man, sampling Pharaoh's beef and gravy mix and finding it. Not half bad. But as every seasoned Turdisi reader knows... Strange eating habits in my world often lead to even stranger travels. Brace yourself, because we're about to embark on a journey that makes eating cat food look like child's play. Fast forward half an hour as I'm debating my dinner options, still reminiscing about the cat food's unexpected culinary delight, my bowels start their time travel shimmy. Seriously? The cat food? I think, already dreading writing this one in the journal. Cat food is a time portal fuel? Why not? I thought. I dashed to the bathroom, locking the door behind me. No pharaoh in sight, probably off dreaming about unforgivable owner betrayals. I settle in, ready for the usual whirlwind trip. But as the room starts spinning, here comes pharaoh, flying out of nowhere, claws out like a cat superhero, landing smack on my back. And off we go. So there we were, pharaoh and I, plopped in the middle of what looked like the set of a prehistoric reality show. Trees? Check. More trees? Double check. It was like Mother Nature had gone wild with the green crayon. The air was so fresh it almost had a taste. Nothing like the city smog I'm used to. The underbrush was a jungle gym of mystery plants and the sounds. It was like nature's own orchestra, minus the conductor. Well, Pharaoh, I said, looks like we've hit the jackpot of untouched wilderness. Time to brush up on those survival skills I learned from reality TV. Pharaoh looked less than thrilled, probably wondering if his nine lives covered time travel mishaps. The forest around us was like nature's version of a labyrinth. No signs, no paths, just endless greenery and the occasional curious squirrel. Fantastic, I muttered, looking around at the endless greenery. It's like we've stumbled into nature's own maze without a map. Maybe we'll run into a friendly caveman who can give us directions. Or better yet, a prehistoric food truck. There I was, hoping for a historic adventure. And what do I get? Lost in a forest that probably predates the concept of lost and found. Hope you're up for a bit of foraging, Pharaoh. It's about to get real bear grills in here. As Pharaoh and I ventured further into the prehistoric forest, the reality of our situation started to sink in. So, buddy, what are the odds we find a five-star restaurant around here? Slim to none? The trees seemed to stretch on forever, like giants gossiping above us. The forest floor was a mix of twigs, leaves, and the occasional mystery berry. Dinner options. Leaves, berries, or... Leaves, I mused. The whole scene was like a nature documentary, minus the helpful voiceover explaining what not to eat. Guess it's time to channel my inner caveman. How hard can it be? Famous last words, right? As we trekked deeper, the chorus of forest sounds grew louder. Birds chirped like they were gossiping about the new arrivals. Us. Every step was an adventure in avoiding roots that seemed to reach out like sneaky tripwires. Hey, Pharaoh! Watch out for the nature's booby traps! I joked. Hunger began to nag at me making me miss the days when food was just an app click away. Foraging for dinner, 
I mused, eyeing a berry bush suspiciously. Just how I imagined spending my evening. Pharaoh, on his part, seemed more interested in chasing shadows than foraging. Guess it's up to me to figure out the menu. Who needs a supermarket when you've got the whole forest at your disposal? I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. My stomach growled so loudly it sent a flock of birds into the air, which earned me a scornful look from Pharaoh. Sorry, nature, I said, half expecting the animals to forgive my intrusion. I couldn't help but think of the beef and gravy cat food back home. Bet you'd prefer that gourmet feast right now, eh, Pharaoh? I chuckled, imagining us dining on cat food instead of foraging in a forest that predated civilization. Note to self, next time pack snacks even if they're for the cat. Just as I was about to pop a particularly juicy-looking berry into my mouth, a figure emerged from the underbrush. This person was different, shorter, sturdier, with wild hair and clothes that were, well, let's just say very au naturel. He gestured frantically at the berry, shaking his head. Turned out, I was inches away from sampling the local poisonous delicacies. Pharaoh, meanwhile, received a reaction that was part awe, part terror. The hunter-gatherer looked at him like he was some mythical beast. Don't worry, I reassured our new friend. He's mostly harmless. Just don't let him near your fish if you have any. The irony of a house cat inciting fear in the heart of a hunter. Gather age humanity was not lost on me. Our Stone Age friend, now a bit more at ease but still eyeing Pharaoh warily, began to communicate through a series of gestures and grunts. It was like playing the world's most primitive game of charades. He pointed at various plants, teaching me which were safe to eat. I nodded, trying to commit his survival tips to memory. Pharaoh, on the other hand, seemed to be enjoying his newfound status as a prehistoric enigma. He strutted around with an air of importance that said, Yes, I am the mighty jungle creature you've never seen before. I couldn't help but laugh. You're a regular celebrity here, Pharaoh. Maybe we should stick around and see if they start worshipping you. Ever say something you immediately regret. So there we were, me trying to communicate with a real-life hunter, gather man and pharaoh basking in his newfound prehistoric fame. Just as we were getting the hang of non-verbal communication 101, a series of cracking noises in the distance caused our new friend's face to turn pale. Oh, what's that? I asked, more to myself than anyone else. It's funny, in other time periods I somehow always knew what people were saying like I had a cosmic translator. But here, nothing. It was like my time traveler's language pack didn't include early human grunts, so much for being the Dr. Doolittle of time travel. Our Stone Age buddy looked like he'd seen a ghost, or maybe a saber-toothed tiger. Either way, it was clear. We were not alone in this ancient forest. Suddenly, grunt, that's what I'd named our Stone Age friend, started biting at his arm and pointing towards the noises. Even without my handy cosmic translator, I got the message loud and clear. Something bad was coming, and it probably wanted to have us for dinner. Pharaoh, sensing danger, leaped into my arms with a look of pure feline terror. Grunt pointed in the opposite direction of the noises and bolted. Well, I guess follow the local, I said, running after him with a cat clutched to my chest. This is turning out to be one heck of a prehistoric cardio session. As we dashed through the forest, I looked to Pharaoh and asked, Still think this was a good idea, huh? His wide-eyed expression was all the answer I needed. He was definitely rethinking his impromptu decision to join this trip. Glancing back, what I saw made my heart race even faster. It was other humans, but not quite. Neanderthals? My memory flashed back to an episode of The Why Files I'd watched, detailing how Neanderthals hunted. Oh, great, I muttered, running from potentially cannibalistic prehistoric humans, just what I needed to add to my time travel bingo card. Panting and dodging through ancient underbrush, I kept pace with Grunt, wondering just how far his prehistoric fitness regime would take us. You know, Pharaoh, I gasped, Next time you decide to tag along, maybe pick a less life-threatening era? Pharaoh clung to me, his claws a constant reminder of his regret. 
As we fled, the Neanderthals in pursuit seemed like something straight out of a horror movie, but with more fur and less dialogue. Note to self, I panted. Avoid any historical documentaries about Neanderthals. It's way less fun in person. Grunt suddenly led us to a cliff overlooking a river, and without hesitation, jumped. I looked at Pharaoh, whose claws were now a permanent fixture in my bare chest, because you know the rules of time travel. Birthday suits only. Well, it's now or never. With a deep breath and holding Pharaoh tightly in my arms, we were off the cliff and into the river in what felt like a blink. The shock of the cold water hit us like a freight train, but it was a refreshing change from the mad dash we'd just endured. Pharaoh, still clinging to me like his life depended on it, which, to be fair, it did, seemed to be having second thoughts about his adventurous spirit. As soon as we hit the chilly water, Pharaoh made a quick tactical move from my arm straight to the top of my head. There he perched, like some sort of feline hat, his claws gripping my scalp as if it were a life raft. Really, Pharaoh? I grumbled, trying to keep us afloat. You just had to pick the highest point, didn't you? As I swam, I could feel his weight atop my head, a constant reminder of just how bizarre our situation was. As we swam away, I wondered if Neanderthals were keen swimmers. I glanced back to see our Neanderthal friends hesitating at the cliff edge. Looks like we're in the clear, buddy, I said to Pharaoh. No prehistoric Michael Phelps up there, it seems. Paddling away with a cat who now probably regrets his life choices, we watched as the Neanderthals just stood there, baffled. Guess they never got their swimming badges, I quipped. Pharaoh, still perched on my head and looking like a drenched fur coat, was not amused. Don't worry, Pharaoh, I joked. I'll add swimming lessons to our time travel itinerary. As we floated downstream away from our prehistoric pursuers, I couldn't help but wonder what other joys the hunter-gatherer era had in store for us. Exiting the river and removing Pharaoh and his claws from my head, I guess Grunt was tired of my nakedness and handed me one of his animal skins to cover up my dingle-dangle, for which I was grateful. Grunt eventually led us to his camp, a cozy little setup that looked like something out of Primitive Architecture Weekly. And there, amidst a group of curious onlookers, was my first ancestor, a rugged, hunter-gatherer type who looked like he could wrestle a bear with one hand. The real star of the show, though? Pharaoh. The moment we introduced him, the camp went wild. They marveled at him like he was some sort of mini-deity. Well, Pharaoh, I said, enjoy your moment of fame. Just don't let it go to your furry head. But it was too late. Pharaoh, reveling in his newfound status, turned on his sweet, loving cat moves. Each woman in the camp was treated to his signature headbutt and purr routine. It was like watching a furry Casanova at work. Look at you, Pharaoh. I chuckled, the world's first cat heart throb. He sauntered around the camp like he owned the place, with each purr and rub eliciting oohs and ahs from his adoring fans. Don't forget who feeds you when we get back to the future, I reminded him, but Pharaoh was too busy being worshipped to pay any attention. Watching Pharaoh bask in his newfound glory, a hilarious thought crossed my mind. What if this is his master plan? To take over the world? one ancient civilization at a time. There he was, weaving through the legs of our hunter-gatherer friends, his every purr and meow commanding attention. Today it's a prehistoric camp. Tomorrow, who knows? Maybe he'll be ruling over a kingdom with humans as his loyal subjects. I laughed at the absurdity of it. Pharaoh, the world's first feline overlord with a time-traveling human as his sidekick. Wait, that couldn't happen, right? I'll have to research that more later, for now I was approaching my ancestor. I tried my best. Hey there, I'm Charlie, your very, very distant relative. So, any romantic escapades in your life? Anyone caught your prehistoric eye? His response? A blank stare followed by a grunt. It was like trying to interview a caveman version of the Mona Lisa. You're quite the conversationalist, aren't you? I quipped. Guess I won't be getting any juicy family gossip from you. 
It was a comedic attempt at bridging a few thousand years gap in social skills. Love life in the Stone Age remained an unsolved mystery. As I was trying to decipher the love life of my stone-faced ancestor, a spear whizzed by my head and thudded into the chest of a bystander. Chaos erupted. The hunter-gatherers around me started grunting in unison, a prehistoric alarm bell. Well, that escalated quickly, I muttered, dodging another incoming spear. Amidst the pandemonium, Pharaoh sprang into action, leaping and hissing, miraculously saving a woman from a Neanderthal attacker. Who knew, I thought. Pharaoh, the prehistoric hero. Maybe he should consider a career in time travel security. In the midst of chaos, Pharaoh, usually a laid-back feline, transformed into a furry warrior. A Neanderthal had sneaked up, snuck up. Hmm, which is it? Moving on, he came up behind one of the hunter-gatherer women, club raised. With feline agility, Pharaoh leaped, hissing and swiping with a ferocity I'd never seen. Startled, the Neanderthal stumbled back, giving the woman a chance to escape. Pharaoh stood his ground, back arched, a pint-sized sentinel. It was a sight to behold, a house cat taking on a prehistoric hunter. Well done, Pharaoh, I thought. You might just be the first feline hero in history. Pharaoh, now the center of attention, stood defiantly, his fur bristled like the mane of a lion. The Neanderthals, unsure of what to make of this fearless feline, hesitated. This gave the hunter-gatherers a chance to regroup and retaliate. Amidst the spears and shouts, I couldn't help but feel a mix of awe and amusement. Never thought I'd see the day when my cat turns into a prehistoric superhero, I said, watching Pharaoh with a mixture of pride and disbelief. This was definitely going into the most memorable moments section of my time travel journal. As I was processing the heroics of my cat, I noticed one of the Neanderthals dragging my ancestor away. Panic set in. I sprinted after them, but they were surprisingly fast. My mind raced with flashbacks from that Why Files episode, how Neanderthals supposedly favored humans as a food source. Great, now it's a rescue mission, I thought dodging branches and leaping over rocks. Save the ancestor. Save the timeline. No pressure, Charlie. My lungs burned as I pushed through the underbrush, determined to not let my family tree get pruned by a Neanderthal's appetite. Suddenly a wave of panic hit me. Pharaoh. I'd left him back at Grunt's camp in the midst of all the chaos. Great, Charlie, real smooth, I chastised myself. Leave your time-traveling cat in the Stone Age. He's probably off starting his own feline dynasty. The thought of Pharaoh, alone and possibly staging a cat coup, added another level of urgency. I needed to rescue my ancestor and get back to Pharaoh before he decided to rewrite history as we know it. See, this is why you don't take cats time traveling. In the flickering firelight, I spotted my ancestor tied up. It was clear he was set to be the Neanderthal's next meal. Time to switch from sarcastic time-traveler to stealthy savior, I muttered to myself. After the Neanderthals finished their what appeared to be bear feast, they seemed sluggish, which worked in my favor. I crept closer, keeping to the shadows. I untied my ancestor with the finesse of a ninja, trying to communicate a silent plan of escape with urgent gestures. Thankfully, he caught on quickly. We made our escape under the cover of darkness, slipping away from the camp while the Neanderthals dozed. Dinner and a show, I quipped quietly, but I'll pass on being the main course. So there we were walking back to camp. Another successful rescue, I mused, courtesy of Charlie's time-traveling rescue service. Making our way back to the camp, relief washed over us. We had narrowly escaped becoming part of the Neanderthal menu. Upon arrival, I found Pharaoh living his best life. The women had made him a veritable throne of fluffy furs. He lay there, basking in adoration, looking every bit the feline deity. Seeing Pharaoh lounging like an ancient feline overlord, a wave of worry hit me. What if I hadn't returned? Would Pharaoh have altered the course of history with his unexpected godlike status among these people? 
The thought of a cat-influenced future was both amusing and slightly terrifying. Time to bring you back to reality, your highness, I said to Pharaoh. It was crucial to get us both back to our own time before our presence made any more ripples in the fabric of history. But still, my other ancestors were nowhere to be seen. Just as we were getting comfy, the camp's warning grunts began to sound off again. What now? Did someone invite the Neanderthals for a rematch? I wondered. Then, out of nowhere, a female Neanderthal charged in, targeting my newly rescued ancestor. To my utter disbelief, my stomach did the time travel tango. You've got to be kidding me, I thought. She's my other ancestor? Watching her drag him away with ease, I realized my family tree was more like a family action movie. Time for round two of ancestral rescue, this time with a twist of Neanderthal romance. Chasing after them, I stumbled upon a scene that was, let's just say, more educational than I'd bargained for. It appeared my Neanderthal ancestor had chosen her mate, and she wasn't shy about it. Just as I was about to turn around, because there are some things you can't unsee. My time travel belly started its dance, and her belly began to glow. Time to go, Charlie, I thought, making a mental note to erase this image from my brain. I turned to rush back to camp for Pharaoh, eager to escape this prehistoric romance novel. Rushing back to camp, the chaos from earlier was simmering down. Amidst the settling dust and relieved sighs, Pharaoh sat like a royal on his fur throne. Even with the prior pandemonium, locating Pharaoh was surprisingly easy. He was still perched atop his throne of furs, basking in adoration. His expression when I scooped him up was pure feline indignation. Sorry, your majesty, I said. Time to abdicate the fur throne. I bolted towards a large tree, the closest thing to a private spot in this era. Pharaoh, disgruntled and disheveled, clung to me as the familiar whoosh began. In a whirl of time and space, we were sucked back through the portal, landing unceremoniously back in my modern bathroom. The abrupt return to the present was a bit too much for my system. Let's just say my bowels decided to celebrate our arrival immediately. Pharaoh, still in my arms and less than pleased about being yanked from his furry reign, gave me a look of utter betrayal. Well, Pharaoh, I said amidst the chaos of our return, that's one way to end a time-traveling adventure. As I cleaned up the aftermath, Pharaoh seemed to be contemplating the perks of being a regular, non-time-traveling cat. Home. Sweet home. Pharaoh looked around, probably missing his fur throne already. Welcome back to reality, I told him, as we both took a moment to adjust to the sudden shift from prehistoric to present. After washing my hands and coming to terms with the abrupt end of our prehistoric escapade, I watched Pharaoh saunter away, his tail high. Probably off to plot his next attempt at world domination, or maybe just to find a sunny spot for a nap. So, to recap, I tasted cat food, time traveled to the hunter-gatherer era, became a part of a Stone Age love triangle again, witnessed my cat ascend to deity status, and barely escaped becoming a Neanderthal's dinner. Just another day in the life of Charlie and his time-traveling cat, Pharaoh. Who knows where or when we'll end up next. Stay tuned for more adventures in the wild world of time-traveling toilets and feline overlord aspirations. And there you have it. Just a typical day in our time-traveling saga. Honestly, who needs a history book when you have a magic toilet and a cat with delusions of grandeur? Stay tuned for what's next in the chronicles of Charlie and Pharaoh the feline overlord. Wrapping up this wild ride, I can't help but wonder what Samantha would think of all this. She's been suspiciously quiet lately. Maybe it's time to bring her into the fold of my time-traveling escapades. Who knows, perhaps she has a knack for prehistoric politics, or can give Pharaoh a run for his money as ruler of the ancient world. Stick around. The next chapter might just feature Samantha stepping into the time-traveling spotlight with Charlie and Pharaoh, the dynamic and slightly dysfunctional time-traveling trio. Now time to write beef and gravy down in my journal on the do-not-eat list. Be sure to enjoy many of the other stories on Odyssey Ark. They make for a great bathroom visit. That is if your digestive tract doesn't double as a time machine.
Till next time, Turdettes, Charlie out.